I'm going to repeat the name. 1854, republishes Dover. There exists more than one edition. The good editions are the ones that have the note on page 7. 7 written as VII. An investigation of the laws of thought in which are found the mathematical theories of logic and probabilities. Until recently, the history of mathematics, read histories of mathematics, it was as if the title were, on which are founded, the mathematical theory of logic. Nobody had succeeded in reading the second half of the book. Actually, one man did succeed, but he didn't quite take the final step that enabled two people, one of whom is me, the other of whom is a professor who just died, and we were working on it at the same time in the 80s. We are trying to read this. And we, we, we finally succeeded. He has a big book, which you can't get hold of. If you write letters to his family and executors, they're not the least bit abusive. They just don't answer. So, um, okay. Now, let's find out. Let's find out what. I quoted in the notice. Let's see if I can find a chapter. Starting in chapter 17, which is called General Method and Probability. It starts at page 253. It's a 399-page book. George Boole does the impossible. He presents the theory of finite probability as a, let's just leave off the finite for the moment. This is an important technicality, of tremendous importance. It was not important for the discussion now. He presents the theory of probability as an equational theory. Now, the theory of probability cannot be an equational theory. The theory of groups is an equational theory. The theory of rings is an equational theory. The theory of modules is an equational theory. The theory of quasi-groups is an equational theory. The theory of semi-groups, the theory of monoids, they're equational theories. What's an equational theory? Well, we first have to give the definition of theory, and I won't. And actually, that vitiates much of what I'm going to say, but that's okay. We've only got so much time. For our purposes, a theory is, this is pre Skoll, Lutarski, Payan, and Hilbert. It's a bunch of statements which include all of their, quote, logical consequences. Now, logical consequence is a notion that only became clear sometime between 1900 and 1930. No matter what Aristotle <coughs> thought he understood, I don't believe he understood what we now call the notion of logical consequence. And, and um, but I'm going to leave that out. I'll just say that to understand it, you have to understand the Galois connection between sentences and models. But he understood the left-hand side very well. No, so we'll work on the left-hand side, because that's going to be how you define an equational theory. An equational theory is the theory of mathematical objects such that the axioms of the theory can be written down as equations. I'm now going to write down the theory of groups, the axioms. And now, much of this talk could be considered as, uh, I could have redone this talk by, by saying, I'm first going to define a type. But I won't. But we do have to mention types here. The theory of group has something called a 1, it has something called a times, and it has something called a minus 1. These are operations. A group, G, <coughs> is a non-empty set, so let's call it underlying of G, with three operations. This operation is called the one. It's a so-called zeroary operation. Now that sounds strange. Operations have to have something to operate on. As it turns out, it's not unreasonable. And your objections are absolutely right. They're correct. And people who do universal algebra now recognize them since about 1970. 
They say that's not really an operation. That you said you're correct. So they distinguish nowadays between subuniverses and subalgebras. Let me leave that aside. Just want to. It is always true that the student who's hearing it for the first time and has an objection. The objection is always correct in my experience. In my life, I have never heard a student ever say that's nonsense and not be right. They may be wrong at the meta level. They think it settles it. It doesn't settle it. But the professor is more wrong if the professor says that's nonsense and it's settled. That's always the case in my experience. OK, now, so it has a 1. And it has a times times. 1 is an operation from nothing into the underlying set of G. Star or multiplication <coughs> is, is, takes two inputs and has one output. And minus one has one input and one output. Might as well start the actual lecture now. So we draw a picture. Here's one. Here's times. Those are pictures of the nature of the operations. They're not, they're not complete, because I haven't specified, I haven't put, I, have, I should label these by the types. The types are elements of G, element 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 of G. And the operation is this. This one's called one, let's label it. It's called star, this one's called this one. Now the axioms are one times x equals x, x times one equals x, and I doubtless will leave some out. This is notation for the operation. You get a result, you do it times z. That's got to be equal to, and tell me if I make a mistake, because I'll make many mistakes. And there's one more. This is bad notation. Those are the axioms of abstract group theory. It's one of the hugest, most successful, and most well popularized subfields of mathematics in, in the world. It is an equational theory. Every time you have an equational <coughs> theory, there's a method for specifying an object in that, in the universe of objects that satisfy that theory. And the method is method of generators and relations. So you give a list of generators. It's called A and B. Let's, let, let's actually do a group. That's a set called A and B. That's a set of generators. Then you say A cubed equals 1 and B squared equals 1, say. That's a, this is too trivial, so I won't do it. I'm going to add in C. This is a very famous group, but I, I want, I'll add in C because the, the generators look too simple. Okay, so let's do A, B, C, B equals what? A, I don't know, the problem is, I can see the, okay, okay. A to the minus one times C to times CB, say, no, that doesn't do it, that'd be the one. Okay. I don't know what that gives you, doesn't matter. Nowadays, if you have a computer, in a few seconds, you can probably tell whether the group's infinite or not, things about the group. You can't always tell. It's undecidable. Yeah. It's undecidable in general. Absolutely. <laughs> Which is a great shock. But like your type computer, you had it with solving undecidable questions. Right, it'd be a very good computer. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason. <purpose. laughs> but now, what does this mean to write, to give something by generators and relations? It means that how is the object single out? It's singled out by the fact it's a group. That's background information. That occurs on a different level. That's background information will not be mentioned again. Then we have some explicit information. A, B, and C are special elements of the group. They're special because they're special. They generate the group. Every single element can be obtained by applying these operations again and again and again. Okay? So therefore, this group can have a most accountable number. They're just uncountable groups. This group can have a most accountable number of elements because it's generated by A, B, and C. 
So the total number of little patterns that you could write by connecting the inputs and outputs is, is, uh, is countable at most. Now, we require of this group that it satisfy these three laws that we've given there. Um, what does that mean? That means that if we take A and we multiply it by itself and multiply it by itself, we get the one element. We take B and we multiply it by itself, we get the one element. If we take A and multiply it times B, times oh, see, this is, I'm using one of the axioms here. Let me, let me make it more formally correct. Okay, right. Okay, but we know that by this axiom, they're all the same. Okay. Now, among all the group now, let me give you a group that satisfies this rule. Let me give you a group. A group consisting of one element. I repeat myself. A group consisting of one element. So therefore, A, B, and C have to all be equal to one. And sure enough, one times one times one is equal to one. One times itself is equal to one. One times one times one times one is equal to itself. The inverse of one, which has to be one, times C times one, times the inverse of, of, of one. That's also, they're equal to each other because they're all equal to one. That's what an equational theory is. Equational theories are very, very important. Volovodsky <coughs> is one of three people leading an attempt, yet again, on the foundations of mathematics called univalent foundations. He has recently said, and he's not the first person who said this, obviously what we want is some, quote, foundational system, which is basically, an, which is an equational theory. The usual axioms of ZFC are not equational, at least not obviously. Now, let me, let me offer a quick argument that I mentioned to Gershom this evening, that this must be true. Because if you look at forcing in set theory, you can see that it's sort of an equational thing. I won't try and explain that. Okay, now, I will now produce another theory, and I will then demonstrate that it is not equational. It is the theory of probability. I'm going to be following George Boole here. What, what time is it? Seven. Probably point of eight. You have as much time as you want. Okay, thanks. Okay, I won't get anywhere. <laughs> but I'll, okay. Let me let me define another theory. The, all these theories are. Who is the univalent foundations fellow? Volovodsky. Right. Okay. Volovodsky, Bauer, and Awodi. How do I spell the first name? Vo a, Vodsky, S k y. Vo v o e, v o d, s k y. Brower and... Uh, no, no, Bauer. Bauer. Andre so Bauer. 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 Foundation. And now, we'll be... Immediately. Say that again? Just say, if you Google for univalent foundations, their names will come up immediately. Oh, so they yeah. should appear immediately in this building. Okay, now, <laughs> we, have, we have now just... We've now just briefly... Quickly told the most important thing about equational theories. You can define objects... I didn't quite finish that. There's a unique object which is the most free object. If you're given generators and relations in an equational theory, there's a unique, we pointed out there's always an object that satisfies the equations, always. Because the, the unit object, which only has a single element, is ground thing. We're not going to describe many sorted or many kind things. It's okay, the same theory. It's, not, it's a little difference. But with a single ground set, G, single substrate, whatever you want to call it, um, all equational theories, there's always a tiny little um, structure that satisfies all the axioms. It's just that you give it anything and it hands you back that element. You give it this thing, this thing, and it hands you back the element. So it all works. Every equation is satisfied in the group with one element. You can't write down an equation using the, the uh, notation of group theory. You cannot write down an equation that isn't satisfied. 
in the group with one element. Now, you can, of course, write in equations. For example, you could say there exists x, there exists y in the group. X not equal to Y. That's not, a, that's not, that doesn't fit into the fission of equation of reason. It's, a, it's an inequation. It forces things apart. The theory of things that force things apart is entirely different from the theory of equations. Say it again? No, we have some now distinctors. Distinctors? Well, thinking of, uh, what's this, uh, oh, Norm McGill and his meta math and his way of thinking. Yeah, right, right. Distinctors. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Raymond Pussy always pointed out that I have I have long wanted to know. Maybe other people. There's a man named what's his first name? Norm, Norm McGill. Norm McGill. He has a wonderful web page. Sort of the sort of as you said the 21st version century version of Principian Mathematica. Yes, he is attempting to. He has his vision of the foundations of mathematics, and if you read it quickly. It seems to be entirely an equational theory in the most literal crude sense. This can't be true. But he introduces at the syntactic level some way of handling this, and I don't understand it. I still don't understand how it can have the effects. Now, I've written to him, but I haven't studied his, I haven't taken him up his offer to teach him. But it, I would love to come to a lecture like this where somebody explains to me how Norm Megel's system can do what he says it does. I don't doubt that it's, it does what he says it does. I just don't understand how it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's actually, that's actually very useful because, let me return here. Up to page 277, whatever it is. This has been entirely, not only absorbed, into standard world mathematics. Let me correct that into mathematics in the European tradition. Okay? Maybe there's some other mathematics in the world that is not part of that tradition. Certainly there's some. But most professors of mathematics work, who have that title, work in the, tr in the tradition, that tradition, the Western European tradition. The first half of that book has not only been absorbed, it is celebrated, it is popularized, although less so today than in 1950 and 1960 and 1970. It is one of the great central advances of mathematics, the discovery of Boolean algebra as part of logic and the foundations of mathematics, and also, curiously enough, as part of the foundations of switching circuits, which Shannon, who perfected information theory, basically invented it in the form we have it today, in the late 40s, in the, in the late 30s, he wrote out paper explaining how relay circuits could be viewed in terms of the Boolean algebra up to page 277 of George Boole. Now, Boolean algebra is an equational theory. I'm going to write down its axioms. I'll probably get them wrong. This is groups. Now we're going to come to Boolean algebra. Instead of the substrate being called the set of elements or group elements, the substrate for let's let's do finite Boolean algebras. And those of you who know equational theory will be jumping up and down and saying, Jay, Jay, you can't do that. It's a different theory. Yes. Yeah. Understood. Nonetheless, we're going to pretend that there exists an ordinary equational theory of finite Boolean algebras. There doesn't people study such things, they just call them the finite equational theories of nowadays or something like that. Instead of having, the, the substrate is called the set of events. So we have a set of events. We have a set of events. This is a terrible name. This is a catastrophically bad name. It has doubtless prevented many people who, who could contribute to probability, or perhaps use it in their work and their lives, from understanding. An event is just an object in some mathematical structure. It's not an event. It just, I mean, it, it has that word, it's nonsense. So, nonetheless, as you all know, I'm the most severe kind of traditionalist. 
when you're young, you can do it, but at my age, it's a little bit, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, sorry, um, sorry, um, I'm a severe conservative and a traditionalist, and so I will call them events. They're not events. Just like a field isn't a field, and a ring isn't a ring, they're, they're not, they just, it's just, it's just, they, they, who knows why they do Who knows why they do Okay, now, here we go, Okay, so, a finite Boolean algebra is a finite set of events. There are the following operations, and you're going to notice right away, there's a one there, it, oftentimes there's something called that, what's that one is? It's a line. Okay. So there's there's a one and a zero. There's that. There's that. And there's this. Okay. A finite Boolean algebra, by definition, is a is a an algebra with a single ground set called the set of events and these operations. And I won't be able to write down the axioms. Okay, so if anybody here knows for sure a set of axioms is sufficient, just shout it out. Okay, but I'll, I'll try here. Okay, x union x equals x. x intersect x equals x. x intersect y or z equals x intersect y union x intersect z x intersect 0 equals 0 x intersect 1 equals x x union 1 equals 1 now wait a second, what, what have I done there? Hmm. Uh, I need one more, right? What, what am I done? I made a mistake already, right? There must be four of them. I can't count. What's two times two? Give me, give me, decategorify me. I know it's two times two. I know two plus two is equal to four. You need to see zero. What? X union zero. It's an intersection. Okay, yeah, X union zero. There we go. Okay, right? So what's that equal to? X, right? Is that correct? Now there's one more. I think that's all. If somebody knows better, and notice these are highly asymmetrical. I didn't include the symmetrical one, which can be deduced from all these. Okay, right. Okay. Now, up through page 277 of this book, a book that has been fully absorbed, a book that, until recently, when they are instead taught Java, this moment, get down. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, they're repealing the Constitution. <laughs> And not even repealing, of course, <laughs> I'm giving them too much credit. They're ignoring formally and announcing that they're going to throw out the Constitution. And now people take courses in computers, and they're not forced to learn this for a two-semester class. Instead, they're taught job. How long do you think this world will last? <laughs> <laughs> throw out this example. This is related to what I'm going to try to talk about. Because this is an equation, these are all equations. Therefore, there must exist a Boolean algebra with one element. There does. It's a very peculiar Boolean algebra. And in it, as must be, we have 0 equals 1. 0 equals 1. That's true. It's an equational theory. There is this an element. We're done. We're finished. You must believe this. 
Otherwise, there's no point in my going on. <laughs> That's okay. I'll prove it. They're both equal to something. Let's call it for the moment thing. Okay? So, thing, union thing. Well, it's only one thing. It's got to be equal to thing. Well, that's already in there. So, thing intersect. This is thing, thing gives thing. This is thing, thing has to give thing. Try it in a sentence. It's got to be the same thing. It's the thing. Everything's the same. Thing. Crush. Okay. If, if a theory. Okay. What this also shows is there's no such thing as an inconsistent set of sentences about an equational theory. They may loosely, in ring theory and other places, use the word, this set of equations is inconsistent. This is impossible if it's an equational theory. It is impossible because the, the, the object with a single element in its ground set is always in there. Okay, now, Boolean algebra, now, now I'll give some other famous examples of Boole, finite Boolean algebra. Take a finite set. Take the, the, the events to be all subsets of the set. Right? Okay. Or as we call them in computer, we use bit strings of length n, if n is the size of the set, and we've got some implicit association with positions of the bit string in our set. So bit strings have, have these three operations. You can take or, you can take and, you can take the zero bit string, you can take the one bit string, it's over here, and you can take the complement. One can now sit down, and in the old days, instead of trying to learn IDEs so you wouldn't have to have to lift the, board, the Java board. play it by yourself. People would, would be told in their first two weeks of class that they would have to prove that bit strings of length, and they'll be asked, what's, what's the N? Uh, I'm cheating. I won't. Okay, they could be asked a little bit later. Is there a set of bit strings that corresponds to that Boolean algebra? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. It's the set of bit strings of length is zero. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to say, but there is no such thing. Yes, there is. <laughs> we'll come back to that in a moment, because this is actually important. Okay, now. Everybody knows that finite sets or bit strings are important. You use them all the time. Blah, blah, blah. I will take, if we are all in agreement, that there's something to these bit strings. What's, what's, what's Google's um, worth on the stock market today? Bits. It have? Lots of bits. Lots of bits. Okay. <laughs> Their success and many other businesses is based on violation of the law. I'm sorry. Is based <laughs> on systematic use of bit strings and other things too. That's the thing. Anyway, so okay. Computers, bit strings, switching circuits, transistors, flip flops, gates, bit strings. Bit strings are very important. They finite Boolean algebra. I'm now going to show you. Okay, so so what did what did what's in the first half of this book? Boole develops the theory of of finite Boolean algebras completely in some sense. He didn't know what an algebra was, but just as Newton knew what a limit was, he didn't have the notion of function. So Boole knew perfectly well what a Boolean algebra was, although he didn't have the general notion of algebra. That was still the future. He also um, states and proves stone duality for the case of finite Boolean algebras. What is stone duality for finite Boolean algebras? Every equational theory has associated to it a category. The category is the category whose nodes are algebras that satisfy the thing, and the maps between them are homomorphisms. That is to say, maps between the ground sets of two different ones such that, quote, the operations are preserved. I'll not go further. 
I'll give an example, though. If you have a bit string and you throw away some of the places, then you get another bit string. That preserves all operations. I'll give you another distinct kind of operation on bit strings. You have a bit string, and you send it to a bigger bit string, but where now each element gets sent to a string of bits. Okay, all the same. Okay, that's another one. That one of them. One of them is a quotient, and the other one is an injection. What do they call it? It's injection of a, of a subalgebra. Okay, now. The category of Boolean algebras is, the, is, is isomorphic to the category, the category of finite Boolean algebras is isomorphic to the category of finite sets, where the map, where the category of finite sets has as objects, finite sets, and as morphisms, just everywhere defined maps, everywhere defined single value maps. And we'll try and describe this. But it's not really isomorphic. It's reverse. It's dual isomorphic. If I have two Boolean algebras, let's call them A and B, and I have a homomorphism from them, and I have a homomorphism going backwards from the set of atoms of A, or actually from the set of atoms of B, going the other way. I won't try to describe this. I may have to come back to it. What are A and B here? Okay, A and B are Boolean algebras, finite Boolean algebras. Okay. And this, this math is a homomorphism. That is to say, for any operation, A1, A2, ah, okay, right, then we have, it preserves operations. If that's equal to A3, then let's call this thing f. Then f of a1 op f of a2 equals f of a3. <clears throat> okay? f is a homomorphism. That is to say, it's a map of the ground sets of, of the set of events. Now, you might think to yourself, you associate the set of events, that's a finite set, with this thing. You don't. That's not stone duality, that's something else equally important but it's not stone duality. Okay, now, anyway, Bull set all this forth. Now we're going to go, and we're, going to, we're, going to, we're now going to present the theory of prob finite probability. We're going to give us axioms, and I'm now going to prove that it's not equational. The object of this talk, I was hoping to give a different talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm capable. Um, The object of this part of the talk is first to show that the, the Boolean the finite probability algebras in Boole sense and in the sense of ordinary mathematics textbooks under that thing, if you Google it or look it up in the library, is not an equational theory. And then I'm going to show that it is an equational theory. Now, that's a contradiction. Fine. It's not a serious contradiction. I, I wish I could present here a proper contradiction. It's not. It's just a different meaning of the words. But at the end of it, you'll see, hey, yeah, that's right. They're kind of like equational theories. It's kind of like an equational theory. And here we go. We're going to leave aside for the moment the um, stone thing. We don't need it for the moment. The stone thing is very big. The Stone Weierstrass, the Nymark, etc. There's all those really fancy things, the rings and these gigantic contexts. And then there's, I mean, there's, yeah, there, okay, I won't. Um, it's big. There are a lot of things where you have a bunch of things with maps in between them that quote preserve the structure. And then often there are a bunch of things, and the categories are the same, except the maps go the opposite way. And the best book in this introductory book is G.F. Simmons, published in 1964 to 63, called Introduction to, I forgot, it's the Gelfand-Nymark Theorem. And that's a great book. 
Okay, now, here we go. Suppose we have a finite Boolean algebra B. Now we're going to write it this way. B is a finite Boolean algebra. As a matter of fact, to stone duality, we know it's isomorphic to the set of all subsets of its atoms. What's an atom? Turns out that elements, events of a Boolean algebra are ordered. There's always a least element called zero. One is the top element. The things just above zero are called the atoms. They're atomic. Every other event is the union of atoms. That is a terrible problem. Because Boole discovered his, his theorem, his general method of probabilities, by working on the side of the, the algebra side of the stone duality. He worked with algebras, and it all makes sense. I'm not sure we have time even just to barely suggest it, but I will, I will try and look at it. Okay. Now, what's a probability? What's a probability option? It's a finite Boolean algebra with a map called probability from the events to the reals, which satisfies the following laws. <coughs> P of 0 equals 0. P of 1 equals 1. These are now real numbers. So P, let's write it. P is a map from the events of B. Let me write events of B. To the reals. P of 0 is 0. P of 1 is 1. Probability of 1 is 1. And let me be, let me be a little bit grotesque here. P of A union B plus P of A intersect B equals P of A plus P of B. That's a terrible axiomatization. It's only good for professional lax theorists. And um, here's a better one. Let me give you a better one. I'm sorry, we're not finished with the axiomatization. <laughs> for all B in events of B, P of B greater than or equal to zero. So this is the, let, let, me, let me give it a better one. If P of, if A intersect B equals zero, then P of A union B is equal to P of A plus P of B. Okay? That's, it turns out that you from that. And as a matter of fact, going this way, it's instantaneous. If A equal, if I just say B is zero, then by this axiom, that's zero. So we cross that out. Then we have P of A union B. Sure enough, that's what it says. It's equal to P of A plus B of B. It's done. <coughs> we can go back the other way, too. Okay, now. I'm now going to prove to you that there's a problem. It's a real problem. It's a serious problem. It does not interrupt as far as I know, although there's some possibility of wrong. That would be great. I've got another three lectures on this issue right here. I'd forgotten about them until this moment. <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna avoid it. I'm just gonna show one thing. I'm now gonna prove that that this is not an equational theory. Now some of you already recognize it's not an equational theory. Fine. I'm, I'm gonna prove it another way, slightly different. Somebody comes up to me and says, I have two elements, A and B. I'm going to give it by generators and relations. They generate some Boolean algebra. And P of A is equal to 1 half. And also P of A equals 3 quarters. You say, oh, Salzberger, did you make a mistake? Did you mean to write B? No. I meant to write A. That does it. We're finished. Probability theory is not an equational theory because there exists no Boolean algebra, even the very smallest Boolean algebra, which has a function from the underlying elements to the real such that A 
the function, the actual single valued function, is equal to one half and it's also equal to three quarters. That's impossible. Therefore, Boolean, uh, therefore, I'm sorry, Boolean algebra do form an equation of theory, probability algebra is two. Nonetheless, the second half of Boole's laws of thought, he defined the notion of finite probability algebra being given by generators and relations. Now, it's a contradiction, contradiction, Jay, of the robot, or maybe even the robot Spock. Okay. That isn't what he said. He said something utterly amazing. He said, if your set of sentences is consistent then he finds a unique probability algebra, which is, in some sense, the freest among all probability algebras. I'm going to repeat myself. Boole knew. He knew this. Boole was George Boole. He knew this. He knew that this, there's no probability algebra. So he added a proviso. He said, suppose you write down a bunch of axioms, or a bunch of conditions, say it's generated by these things, and it has these things, like you might have Boolean conditions. Who knows what you got? Doesn't matter. You might have probability conditions. Doesn't matter. He then found the unique, most free Boolean algebra. So first, he has to find a Boolean algebra. That's okay. Some of the conditions will be will be um, expressed purely in terms of Boolean algebra. It's an equation of theory. I, I'm actually lying, but I, I'm not much lying. It's irrelevant that I'm strictly lying. That's very important to understand. Okay, it's just irrelevant. Often relevant when I lie. It's not relevant. Um, so modulo a few assumptions which are harmless to the discussion. You do it in two parts. You first of all apply the Boolean algebra relations and get them. And then he has some way of finding a probability thing. Now, that's not actually the method. But we, we, could, we could for the moment say that's what it is. The method is actually much more interesting. Here's what he does. What I said is true, but that's not how the theorem is proven. He throws out all the Boolean. Step one. He throws out all the Boolean relations. And then considers the Boolean algebra generated by the generators, which are A through Z, say. Let's assume you know, 26 generators with very complicated relations, Boolean relations, such as you might find in the midst of a, fee, a, a proof by computer of some properties of some circuit that's an adder or something. You, they have pieces that do this. Sort of thing. But, but so, so he throws out those relations. And he ends up with the free Boolean algebra of the generators. Now, the free Boolean algebra on the generators is a very famous thing. Free Boolean algebra in the generators is the Boolean algebra, you're not going to like this, whose set of, it's isomorphic, it's set of atoms, not set of events, it's set of atoms is naturally isomorphic to the set of bit strings with the uh, places labeled by A to C. <laughs> the, right, the, we, like A, B, C up to Z. Now mark each one of them with plus or minus. Plus, plus, minus, 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 plus, plus, minus, minus. That symbolizes, every time you see a plus, just write down A. Every time you see a minus, then intersect it with a negation. Intersect C, intersect D, intersect E minus, up to Z minus. That's how many 
atoms there are in the free Boolean algebra on the set A and <coughs> Now, the, the, basically the central theorem of equational theory then says that, call this Boolean algebra that's free, call it A. There exists a unique homomorphism down to B, the algebra given by generators and relations. Okay? Now, this is how Boole got his thing. Okay, so here's what he does. A is generated by these things. We know the probabilities of the generators. I'm skipping over stuff. We know the probability of the generators. If not, Boole discusses the problem where you do know them. A free Boolean algebra, if we know the probability of the generators, there's a unique way of extending the probability to be defined at all the events. It's what every single student, and this is an example, the phenomenon that I described, that students in a class, when they raise objections to what the professor says, are always right. And the professor is usually wrong to suppress them. So, what's the probability? If I, if I know the probability of the atoms, I know the probability of everything, because by this rule, everything's a union of atoms, actually unique. And I just add up the probabilities of all the atoms going into well, if I know the probability of A, then I can get the probability of this thing as probability of A times now it's, it's B. So it's 1 minus the probability. It's, it's the probability of B complement, which has to be 1 minus the probability of B by these laws. 1 minus the probability of B, or better yet, just write it P of B complement. Keep on going. So, so all the atoms, the 2 to the 26 atoms, we know their probabilities. OK. So let's assume with the student and with Boole that that's, if we knew the probability of the generators and we could make them all independent, we do make them all independent probabilistically, the whole set. Every student in the first class of probability, when they're faced with a probability problem, just assumes this. Then the professor later on comes up. The corrects with his, oh no, 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 there are lots of other probabilities. No, they're not. There's only one natural probability. The professor is technically completely correct according to the definitions. The student, however, is more right. <laughs> the line of development of the professor completely avoids discovering stat net, whereas the line of the student and a pool led in 1854 to the discovery of the partition function of stat net, the method of maximum entropy estimation. Now, I'm going to show you how he did it. And then I'm going to connect it with the Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen paradox. I won't have time. Because <laughs> the proof, when I sat down to write it out, going down the subway, let me tell you, the moment of panic was severe. What do I do now? What the hell do I do now? I'm going to get a lecture, dead man. I don't know the proof. <laughs> no, I've adroitly avoided giving the proof. But I know the proof now. We don't have time to do it. <laughs> so here we go. In, 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 in the setup here, here's what we have. We have A. And we have, I have the event. Um, we have A. A is the free. A is the free, what would it be? Let's start with it. We have an injection into B. This is the thing given by generators and relations. OK? There are tiny little Boolean algebras that get injected into B. OK? Namely, the Boolean algebra generated by A is very simple. I'm going to write down the Boolean algebra in one generator. It B was the thing with the complicated relations. B, B. This is the B. Right. <laughs> it's got many complicated relations. It's here's here's how it's done. Mm -hmm. go over. It's generated by A through C. There are a bunch of Boolean relations. Yes. And then Boole got to this. You could start with other things. 
you got to it where you got Boolean relations plus the probabilities of each of the little generators is simply given to you. That's the problem that he actually works on. But he understands that not all problems are given to you that way, like mm -hmm. stat met problems aren't. But he knew how to go from there to this. So now, here's the Boolean algebra of one generator. There's A and A complement, mm -hmm. and there's zero, and there's one. Because you're not going to get anything else, no matter what combinations of A you write down. You're only going to get A or A prime or one or, one or zero. Now, yeah. so we now have the injection of these little tiny things. Let's call them the Boolean algebra generated, generated by A, the Boolean algebra generated by B, up through the boolean of the bag generated by C. They get all injected into B. Okay? They're, if they're not freely injected. They're not free. Over here, we introduce B A B A G of, let's call this A underscore. It's like A, except it lies in the thing that it freely generates along with the other ones. Maybe not the best formalism, but I didn't think I would talk on this. OK, here we go. Over here on the left, this is a diagram of free generation. We have these little Boolean algebras. Then they lie, and these little things, they lie inside of the big free Boolean algebra, which, remember, has for atoms all objects that look like this. OK? Now. There's a unique quotient map, and this is equational theory. There's a unique quotient map from the free Boolean algebra on these free things down to here. Let's call that the quote. Okay, now, now we're almost done. Now we're almost done. What is the space of all probabilities on an algebra of this kind? It is isomorphic to the unit interval. The coordinate is the probability of A. Once I know the probability of A, I know the probability of A prime because it's 1 minus it. So that's not a coordinate because we've already specified it. So we're not going to use it as a coordinate. It's OK. We don't need a coordinate for 0. The probability is 0 because it's 0. We don't need a, a coordinate for the probability of 1. Probability of one point. We've solved, we're going to repeat what we've done. We've solved the problem of estimating an unknown probability in the case that looks like this. We have the probabilities of these things, and together they lie in a free Boolean algebra. We just say they're independent. Every student believes this. You have a coin flip, probability is a half. You have, you have a, a die being rolled, one out of six for each of the possibilities. And if you flip the coin and you, and you, and, and you throw the die, then I can tell you the probability of any combination of outcomes. It's the unique probability that makes those two events independent. I have a defined independence. <laughs> I'm not going to get through today. OK. <laughs> Nonetheless, you all know what it is to be probabilistically independent. I'll formally define it. Here's the probability, probability table, 1, 2, up through 6. Here's the probability table, heads, tails. So that's 1 half, 1 half. This is 1 6. 1, 6, 1, 6. Now go down here. The probability table for both of them is you multiply this and that. You form the rank 1, the tensor, the Kronecker combination of those two vectors. That's called, then you say that these two probability algebras, or probability distribution functions, are independent. Yeah. Taking a quotient of Boolean algebras is equivalent to specifying that some of the atoms of A go to zero. So remember, our probabilities can be any specific number. I'm just saying again. Does it have to be zero, or can it be? No, it has to be zero. No, no, not probably zero. It's a Boolean algebra. It's in Boolean algebra. If, if you're in a relation, okay. right? Okay. You're setting something equal to zero. Yes. So that sense of setting, or false. We're just setting. We're just setting. We're just setting. Um, 
sum of the atoms, of which there are an absurd number here, 2 to the 26, although not as many as in stat map, where you get numbers like 10 to the 23 in the exponent. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so, um, so we get, so we get, we get, um, so we know what to do here. Who just transported the probability across to B? And then he had to prove a theorem. But let me just tell you what the transport is. So we have all these atoms. They all have probabilities. So the 2 to the 26, each one comes a little number between 0 and 1 attached to it. It adds up to 1. It adds up to exactly 1. A probability is given by real numbers between 0 and 1 on the atoms that add up to 1. This is, again, passing back and forth between a set of atoms and the whole blue atom. This is, this is called a probability distribution function, not a probability. A probability is defined on the events, or let's say on everything on all combinations, unions of atoms. This is just defined in the atoms. So now, we cross out some of them. I mean, the first one here is called zero. Next one up to two to the 26 minus one. Okay? And we just throw out some. We throw this one out, and this one out. That's equivalent. Any Boolean relation is equivalent to this atom's equal to zero. This atom's equal to zero. It's a collection. That collection is equivalent to any Boolean relation. That's not obvious. This is due to George Boole. This is a big theorem. Big theorem. Big. Okay, yeah. I'm going to find the partition. The partition function is the sum of all these probabilities that remain after you've thrown out the thing. It's equal to the sum of those probabilities once you suppress the thing. It's the sum of the probabilities of the atoms that remain after you apply this operation and just throwing them out to get the quotient. Now, Boole proved the following theorem. Given your relations, Boolean relations and probabilities, generators, if there exists any probability algebra that satisfies those relations. And in general, in stat met, there will exist many. How many? Again. Ten to the Avogadro's number appears in the exponent. And since the number of thermodynamic things you measure is like under ten usually, if it's a big plumbing system, it might be five hundred. But that's much smaller than two to the 10 to the 2 to the quantity 10 to the 23. So there are a lot of different probability algebras that will satisfy the relations that you're given. Every measurement in stat mac of a quantity that you can measure is equivalent to, not specifying the atoms, it's something else, but I'm leaving that part of the transform out, but yes. It's just, you get rid of, okay. you can see that most of them are going to be freely variable. The, 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 the main theorem of step mech, which is not actually a theorem, but an observation slash assumption slash wish slash mistake, is that, and, and James writes, he wrote a book on that, distinguishing those cases. Um, given these probabilities, these are the probabilities we're actually told. P of A in B is equal to 1 fifth, P of B, P of B and B is equal to 0 0.01, P of C equal to 9 tenths, et cetera. Okay, now, over here, if there's any probability algebra that satisfies these conditions, Boole proved in 18, he didn't prove it, he, he, he had a proof, but he thought it was so obvious. Mm -hmm that he didn't need to prove it. He was the student. He said, well, don't bother me. He doesn't need to prove it. This is the meaning of probability. It's an equational theory. He stated that there's a unique, there's a unique assignment of probabilities over here, such that when you take the quotient, you get these. And that's true. And the resulting probability up here is the maximum entropy estimate.
What time is it? Eight <laughs> Okay, I'm going to. I'm going. I won't quit, but I'm. But I'm going to skip over the most interesting part of the talk for me. <laughs> what would that? What would that? I, 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 I can't. I, I have to write down thirty symbols and explain their meanings. Well, what would it, what would have been? Okay. Uh, okay. Well, Does anybody have a copy of JS Bell? Or does anybody have a computer connected to the net? I have. I, I can do it here if you want. It'll take me a minute. Okay. Put in, put in speakable. It's going it's to take. Speakable. It's going to take me a minute or so. I'm using it. Whatever. Okay, don't worry. About it. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it later. If you want to. Okay. Now we come to. I'm going to give the history. I won't. I won't state the, the, the result. I'll give some history. In the 1920s. I'll be out of here. Now. In the 1920s. Give me, tell me seven minutes before it's over. In the 19, by the 1920s, Schrodinger, Einstein, many other people were absolutely convinced that whatever was the probability used in quantum mechanics, it could not be the probability of which they were masters. They knew this and they said so again and again and again. It is a lie of the popular press, stupendous in scale, that it was probabilities that bothered Albert Einstein. No, it was that it wasn't the probabilities that he knew and understood as well as any human being on Earth. Now, so Bohr and Carver Mead has written on this. Let me, let, everybody knows that Richard Stallman has made a difference in the history of the world. Everybody knows that Bohr is a great man, is a great physicist, is a great philosopher, wherever he is. He was catastrophically damaging to the advance of quantum engineering in that he succeeded in stopping most of the best people in physics from thinking about these issues. Arthur Mead's written about this. And he, I, I'm not sure I've read it, but he's right. Because it's just obvious if you look. It's a catastrophically damaging thing to the advance of engineering. It's been corrected now. The newspapers are full of quantum computing. He stopped it. It would have been there in 1960. Not there, but people would have understood. Yes, yes, we can probably build one. Okay, so. I've lost the track of Newton. Okay. No, I'm done. I've got it back. How did they know that it wasn't regular? I don't know. I'd love to know. I've had a few glimmerings in the past five years. And if I have time, um, I, will, I will try and understand it. But I know of no account that explains it to me. How did they know? How did they know that it wasn't regular? So, so what happened, famously, Bohr and Einstein used to argue about, I can't even tell what people think they were arguing about. I know what they were. 1935, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen published a short paper. I heard that um, it was published without Einstein's permission. I'm not sure that's true. He, however, never disowned it. Okay, let's see what they published. These are the equations of an algebra. Okay, and I'm now going to come to something which is, it, it's like, it's like, um, it's like this business about um, the maximum entropy estimate. Oh, let me just say, let me just give, let me just explain the maximum entropy estimate. When, when you teach students about Markov chain, let me draw a Markov chain. Here's a Markov chain. Is a Markov chain. You attach, quote, random variables. They're actually elements of a Boolean algebra as far as we're concerned. And you're told about if the probability, you're told that, that, that what comes in here influences the probability of what comes out there. There's some formalism for this. The student then immediately writes down the correct solution to those equations. And then the professor corrects them and says, ah, you forgot the Markov condition. And the professor then points out that there aren't enough equations to uniquely determine the probabilities. 
And the student looks and says, that's nonsense. What the student has done is calculate using Boole's method, the probabilities, implicitly. It turns out that in this case, the computation is rational. The, the answer in terms of the data, each number is a rational function of the data. Let's repeat that. Each, to compute the complete probability distribution of a market, that, that there are many, many, there are many, many probabilities, usually, that satisfy you know, the condition that if this is such and such, and the probability that, the conditional probabilities here. Okay. Usually, if you count constants, dimensions, you can see that there are a great many. But the student will never, ever even consider. They're not even visible to it. Why? Because the world is equational. The student knows how to calculate, in this case, the solution in the equational theory of probability, and he does it. Now, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen published a similar circuit in 1935. I'm going to write that circuit in. This is the Markov chain. We won't have time, but it's closely related to Wigner's friend. And Wigner's friend causes no problem. I'll just state this baldly, a declaration without support. Causes no problem. It can all be interpreted fine in classical probability. There's simply this is this is zero problem. <laughs> this is the most important diagram in the history of quantum mechanics by an enormous factor. It's the first diagram that shows that quantum mechanics exists. Obviously, I'm lying in some sense. <laughs> but it's not untrue what I said. Shows that quantum mechanics are different from classical mechanics. Jerry, have these things up if you want. Please look up. Please put into Google speakable and unspeakable in quantum mechanics. Just put in speakable and unspeakable. You'll get back and try and put in scribe D. Put in the word scribe D. We're going to commit. We won't technically commit copyright violation, but we'll actually be an edge. And as a member in mostly good standing of the free software movement, we believe in strict adherence to copyright licenses. We don't believe people should be um, simply get low um, because they might have downloaded a song that would cost them a dollar to buy from what you call it. So we may disagree as to the degree of punishment, but we think that the person should not have downloaded that song. They should instead have taught themselves the instrument, composed the song, <laughs> and then sung it for free on street corners. <laughs> It's how we the build the operating system that Google intends to take over the world. <laughs> this is up next. Okay. This is the diagram of the um, Einstein for Dulce Rosen circle. And because I can remember nothing at this point. the generalization of the, it, it's an application, it's a generalization. It, it's, it's none of those because before you ever heard of Boolean algebras, you, you, you know how a circuit of gates behaves. 
you know perfectly well how a circuit of gates behaves. You might not be in command of any formalism that will fit into the standard classes in probability theory or circuit design, but you know you, you will never make an error on the important philosophical issues. You won't know some facts about the odd behavior or lack of odd behavior on the circuits, but you know what a circuit is. So this is the einstein podolsky rosen here is the left particle. That's called the left particle channel. This is called the right particle channel. This is called the left input. This is called the left output. This is called the right input. This is called the right output. This gate we're going to call the left chamber gate. It should be LCG. <laughs> let's call it, let's put a G in there. <laughs> a gate, a probabilistic gate, with no inputs. That's okay. It has no inputs, just like one. Right, it just generates that. It doesn't have to look at something and decide how it's going to act. It acts from within. <laughs> Hidden variable. No! I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Who said that? <laughs> okay, okay. That's free will? I have the free will paper here. <laughs> I don't understand it, and I neglected to invite oh, Conway. You might have come. That generator up there has free will. I get that that's free will. Yeah. The answer is yes. That's, that, that's actually a good question. <laughs> the is this the definition of free will? Now, LP is just a set. It's a set of possible values, signals that can get sent along this, this wire, or chamber, or something like that. Or a piece of email or something. This is this is the same thing. It's the right part. We place no restrictions on the set of possible signals in RP and LP. We do place restrictions on the set of possible outputs on both sides and on the set of possible inputs. This one, I probably I'll probably get this wrong. Instead of this one being 0 minus 2 pi over 3. I think that's it. Do you mean an interval? No. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are two settings. Now, here's okay. what this stems from. An electron, mm -hmm. a pair of electrons which are in, word. this is not a bad word, but the problem is that it has, it has too much. It implies too much. There's a single electron, which is in a pair of electrons, which is in a singlet state. They are gently perturbed in such a way that one electron goes here and the other electron goes there. Then there are instruments in here, Stern Gerlach devices, which I must now correct some of the popular things. It's not that there's a magnetic field, it's an inhomogeneous magnetic field. And this causes the electron to do something you can see on a screen sometimes. Or actually not on the screen. You can see something else. It's a, eventually, your computer nowadays has a tube at the end. photo tube. Right, that would work actually. Right, I don't know if they do that. I don't know. That's why. Okay, whatever it is, you can see it. So if you set the device at zero degrees measured from somewhere, and and this one you set at zero degrees measured from somewhere, you will get. Um, I didn't tell you. Okay, so we restrict the inputs to be over here. This is unrestricted. Unrestricted. Mm -hmm. This set has to be up or down, and this is a terrible notation. In other words, we now we come to and this is important. Now, now we come to actual type theory. This is really important. We come to actual type theory. <laughs>
come to actual type theory. Um, who remembers the scheme standard? Who remembers the who remembers the C standard? I don't remember anything. I don't know the C standard. I don't know much about the scheme standard. Come on. There is okay. You can say, look, Jay, you wrote up and down. And, and you wrote up and down here too. Well, are these the same up on both sides? <laughs> Type error. There's no equality relation defined on elements, an element from here and an element from here. Nothing. It's not that they're unequal or disjoint or the same. There's no such question. This is type theory. This is the heart of type theory. And the same thing here. 0, 2 pi over 3. At the level of the theory that gives us the prediction, as a matter of fact, yeah, they, they all are in one type. But for the theorem, you apply type theory strictly. And it makes no sense to say, is that 0 the same 0? It's not relevant. It can't be answered. It's meaningless. That is not the same thing as saying that they're not equal. It says you made an error in what you asked the machine or your type theorist. So you're trying to mul multiply two letters together. You can't multiply two letters together. Right, unless you have to find a multiplication. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So now, here's the result. I'm going to erase this. You don't need it. And I'm going to write something that's too difficult. Horrible. It's what I was doing on the subway. compare to like saying, is me standing on my head the same thing as you standing on your head? Um, what I would suggest <laughs> is the way you would tend to capture this is um, you could use existential quantification, and I think that might actually capture what you're getting at. So if you say there exists an A such that zero over here, and you have there exists an A such that zero over there, you know, in both cases, you can't then, you know, there is, that the right, exists right. an A that you quantified over, those two right. alphas are you know, inheritable, right. and therefore your things are incomparable. I'm, I'm saying right, right. I'm saying right, but now this, this is an unimportant lie. I'm saying right. It's an unimportant lie. I'm suggesting that I have a much greater command. I don't know what an existential type is, except for what you just told me. Mm -hmm. But I begin to get the idea, I think, maybe a little here. I just don't know. But right, right. Okay. It's just a, yeah, I will, I will, okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Type theory is not crazy. I just want to, that's, that's a big deal. A man my age never learns anything, right, anymore, right? But I learned that type theory is not crazy in the past few years. Okay, now. Yeah, you see how horrible this is in a moment. You see how terrible. Down here, LO also. This is this is a very important theorem which um, Einstein missed, which shows from the culture at the time it's a difficult theorem. 
and it's not difficult from our culture now, but it hasn't made it down to the level of popular accounts. And actual physicists are confused about it. Now, and, and you've got to fill in you. Now, this, this diagram with decorated um, edges, let's call that the underlying diagram. We'll include the decoration. Now, there are, known to me, um, I think there are four um, different uh, regimes. There are four different things we can do with this diagram. We can say, we're going to consider our gates as being, one, deterministic. Let's just say classical deterministic. Okay. I'm not sure whether or not the classical is one. But, but it is certainly pre-quantum. Um, we could say <coughs> we could say probabilistic. Classical probabilistic. We could say they're, and this is the craziest one, we could say they're non-deterministic in the sense of non-deterministic Turing machine. We could say they're quantum probabilistic. So there are four different ways of using the four different worlds. And we could produce for each world we could, we could, for example, for the deterministic world, let's actually do the deterministic world. The deterministic world goes as follows. This thing always puts out the same pair of signals. Puts out the same pair of signals. <coughs> okay? We, now, given a signal here and a signal here, it always puts out exactly the same output. Given a signal here and a signal here, it always puts out the same output. There's no probabilities. You, you know, if you know the incoming things, you know the outgoing things. There's no probability involved. What? What time is it? Ten, ten, ten minutes left. Things. Okay. Now, for the, for, the, for the deterministic case, let me explain what this diagram is. This is, this is a picture of the, of the thing which, which this circuit might compute. Okay. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I really would like to have my, I'd like to fill it in. And I think I can fill it in. One more to go. Let's see if I can read my writing. Should be able to remember this because it's easy enough. Okay. Now, 
I said I'd start with a deterministic, but I've written down a probabilistic, I've written down a probabilistic I.O. behavior. Let me explain what I mean by that. This is the circuit. You can put gates in here. There's some rule for going from the behavior of each of the gates, there are three gates, to the behavior of the whole circuit. What's the behavior of the whole circuit? It's that function. We have to define, these are input lines, so there are two input lines and there are two output lines. If I peg this input line at zero, the left one, and I peg the right input line at zero, then the left output and the right output being up at the same time, the probability is zero in case these were electrons. And they were originally in the singlet state. There were two electrons in the singlet state. This is some little quantum mechanical rule. It's sine squared, a half, something like that, a difference, whatever it is. I, I'm, not, I'm not being precise because I would have to then spend at least 20 minutes making sure I hadn't made a sign error. Okay? So, um, or something like a sign error, or a cosine. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so um, now, John Bell proved that no circuit made of classical probabilistic gates having this form. No matter how big the space of left particles is, no matter how big the space of right particles is, can ever have this I.O. behavior. He proved that's impossible. And how did he prove it? He proved it by showing this is an I.O. behavior. This is, a, this is an I.O. behavior. This is a specification of a single I.O. behavior. It's, it's a complicated thing. How many numbers has it got? It's got a lot of numbers. It's a complicated thing. It has all sorts of structure. It has inputs and outputs. He first showed, and this was not understood for a long time, because if you look up page 15 in scribe D of his book, Speakable and Unspeakable, you will see his proof of the following fact. He said, page 15, you say? Page, bottom of page 15, I think. I should have put them down. OK, let me form, let me form um, a, uh, a bipartite graph. I'm going to form the complete bipartite graph. This is the, the bipartite graph consists of two sets of nodes. It's a complete bipartite graph, so we have two nodes, we have two nodes, and then we have every line, every edge between a node here and a node there. Now notice that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. I drew it in this funny way. So you can see that, let me put in this thing here now. Zero, zero, one half, one half. Okay? This thing is three-eighths, Three-eighths, one-eighth, one-eighth, okay? This thing's also, all the rest are the same, okay? Now, we could consider the nodes. We could imagine the nodes are two-valued random variables. Now, unfortunately, at this point, I'd have to explain, I don't count the times for the random variables. Random variables are very hard to understand. Most of the books are terrible. Recently, Wikipedia approved their treatment of the last time I checked. It could be entirely a biography of Sarah Palin. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, um, last time I checked, there was uh, uh, their probability thing was the best introduction to probability I've ever seen in my life, about two years ago, except for the treatment of random variables, where they was technically correct, but they were not completely clear. Okay, now. <laughs> no, they're completely clear, but technically <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I don't know. Everything they said about Sarah Palin, I think is true. But um, no, <laughs> they were correct. Okay. Um, okay. So now, this 
is a description of the I.O. River. Remember, it's an I.O. behavior. It says, if you put this here and this here, you get these outputs. That's what this means. Peg the inputs at zero, you get that output. Peg this one at 2 pi over 3 and that one at zero, you get this output. Peg this thing at uh, minus 2 pi over 3, you get that output. No, okay. That is logically not the same thing as what this diagram is. This diagram is very simple. We imagine there's a single joint distribution on four random variables, each one of which can take u or d. u, d, u, d. Once again, they're different types. And we now, come, somebody comes up to you and says, I've got a single joint distribution on four random variables. These four random variables, they have, I give you four, a certain four. I don't give you all. I don't give you the whole distribution, right? I don't give you the whole distribution. I give you some information about it. The information that I give you is the joint distribution of this and this. That corresponds, to, the, the nodes correspond to the, to the, to the inputs, OK? I give you that, and now here's what, here's what Bell did. His theorem consists of two parts. The first part, you don't find in the literature. It's there, and people have understood it, but it doesn't, it's not front and center. Maybe, I'm out, maybe it now is. I'll give a meta argument that it's not. It would have appeared in the popular press and it hasn't. Okay, so Bell first proved and the proof is not obvious. It was obvious to Bell. He just looked at it and said, he's got like two sentences. He said, it's obvious that this I.O. behavior is equivalent, a possible I.O. behavior is equivalent to a consistent set of joint marginals. It's not obvious. And I forgot the proof. I'm walking toward the subway. I'm in fear. It was okay. I got on the wrong train. By the time I'd gone past my stop, I had the proof. So um, it was, wasn't too far. So, um, okay, now, one of the things, if these are joint marginals, let me give you a condition. That, suppose they're consistent joint marginals. Let me give you a condition that they must satisfy. I can compute the probability of this variable in two ways from the information I'm given. I can marginalize out this variable, and I can also marginalize out that variable. Here. Here's a, here's, here's a top element. We have an element in PDF of A, B, C, D. Okay? We're now given, we marginalize down to A, B, C, D. We marginalize down to A, B. Okay, so that's A, B. That's B, C. That's A, D. And that's C, D. Okay? If we have the probability, the joint probabilities of the two variables A and B, if they came from a single, from a, uh, actually a, a single giant thing on all four of these variables, then I can compute the probabilities of the variable A and B taking on as two different values. I can compute them by marginalizing out B here and marginalizing out D there. They must be equal, those two. Those two things must be equal. Now, let us suppose we were only given three. Let's suppose we were only given three joint variables, three pairs, three joint distributions of pairs of variables. Suppose we were given this, A and B, B and C and A and B. Theorem. Those are the only conditions needed for joint consistency. That's a theorem. That's a theorem. Okay? So in other words, to check, somebody comes up and claims, let's just forget about this last one. Can I find a distribution on that, 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 and that, each of them taking two values you want? Can I find, over here, can I find a joint distribution for the four variables? Such that the joint distribution down to here is that, uh, the pair, the pair one. The answer is yes. All I have to do is check to see that each one of them is a distribution. That is to say, greater than or equal to zero, add up to one. And when they marginalize down to the same thing, it matches two different ones. Now, if I do this, there 
exist arrangements of four putative joint marginals which satisfy that condition. They're called the Kolmogorov consistency conditions. But there exists no single distribution that goes down to them. And John Bell, that's the second half of John Bell's theorem. He first proved that the that there's an isomorphism between the space, the convex, the, convex set, the convex set of possible classical I.O. behaviors of a circuit with that, having, having that shape and those types where we specify them, and the set of consistent, you know, a cycle of, of joint marginals like that. He showed they're isomorphic to each, to each point of the one is a point of the other and vice versa. Then he showed that, as a matter of fact, there's another condition beyond the Kolmogorov consistency conditions that must be satisfied in order that these, and as a matter of fact, this thing doesn't satisfy it. And I'll, I'll give you the condition. It's not the one that appears in the paper, but it's a well-known condition. <laughs> now I'm going to, now I'm going to, now I'm going to, for the moment, identify the U's and the D's, which I said I wouldn't. It's okay, because there's some action, and we can get rid of the identification. And this is, this is, this is homology. It's actually homotopy. And it doesn't matter what you name things. You still, if you go around and end up in another leaf, you're going to end up in another leaf. Okay. This plus that plus that, plus that, plus that, has to be less than or equal to 4 minus 1. And they're not. That's the condition. And Bell noticed this. And remember, quantum mechanics says an influence propagates here. There's, there's no information passes from here that are record. And then you get these results. And there is no classical probabilistic explanation. That's Bell's thing. Oh, one more thing. My theorem. That's equivalent to um, to each of these. We have a maximum entropy estimation problem. Namely, we're given we're given these joint marginals. If 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 there's no cycle, the maximum entropy estimate is a rational function of the data. Actually, this is basically equivalent. This is, this is the Markov chain, it turns out. You can direct it as you please. It's a Markov chain. We're done. If you add in this one thing, you have to solve a higher degree polynomial equation. Only one of its roots gives rise to a probability. The other ones are complex numbers generally. Therefore, they're not probabilities. But nonetheless, they have other roots. If and only if they have other roots, are there Bell's inequalities? There's an old theorem. It was doubtless known in 1950 in the cryptographic services. Almost surely true. Um, I don't think they noticed. They may have the connection with quantum mechanics. I don't think so. But they could have. But they certainly knew the theorem. I have no evidence for this beyond my field, which was once good for what they knew back then. Um, that's it. So that's the end. Of, let me tell you the theorem that, that I couldn't remember and was in a panic. And, and uh, it's the theorem that shows behavior isomorphic to system. If there exists a classical probabilistic behavior with this table, then there exists a single joint distribution with, that goes down to those marginals and vice versa. If you can find a single joint, etc. That's it. End of, end of, end of talk. Thank you.